Matt Bell, the acclaimed author of Scrapper. Thank you all so much um, for being here and for helping us celebrate. Uh, I'm the, the newest faculty member of the MFA program here. It's my second fall. I feel really lucky to get to be a part of ASU and a part of this MFA program. Um, when I was 23 or 24, uh, Hayden's Fair Review, the literary magazine here, sent me my first personal rejection as a writer. Um, when I was a grad student, five years later, they published a story of mine, which is very exciting for me. And then probably like five years after that, I got to start teaching here. So that's a really nice progression. When you submit to Lit Mags, you should all just do that. Um, <laughs> it's very easy. Uh, no. <laughs> It's very exciting to get to, to be a part of this, and so I'm so glad to be here. I'm going to read a very short part, um, the end of the first chapter of my new novel, Scrapper. Um, the only thing you have to know to listen to this is the protagonist, Kelly, uh, is a man originally from Michigan. He's just returned to Detroit after 10 years or so of living in the South. Um, he's fleeing sort of the fallout of his family there, um, and he's unable to find work and ends up scavenging for metal in the abandoned buildings in, in Detroit in an area that he calls uh, the zone. Thank you so much. There had once been a magnificence to these streets, and the evidence of those times was still there, in the zone, in edifices to ideas that had not lasted. On many days, Kelly saw the endurance of the beautiful, the way the slow degradation of acid rain and other weather would make the zone more lovely, not less. He entered churches where painted crosses faded from the walls, where wind howled some days through stolen stained glass, when other days birds flitted between the iron braces left behind. The braces waiting for the theft, the pews remaining but the organ pipes long gone, dust and smatter everywhere, a city silt fallen, unswept, a manifestation, the refuse of long ago prayers, the birds nesting in the rafters, American gods, American temples, all the evidence anyone needed to indict the temporariness of American belief. He walked shredded schools, lacking students, but not piles of serviceable desks, ran his hands along the spines of books left behind, the previous fictions of history, stories no one wanted to steal. Bottles of printer's ink lined glassless windowsills, glowed in shafts of sunlight, colored vacant offices blue and red and black and super blue. The locker rooms lay unlocked, the locker doors removed, the open walls spilling onto gym floors made of century dead trees, the wax scuffed with shoes and time tagged with layers of spray paint. He wandered the rows of empty houses and overgrown yards, roamed grassy blocks beneath bare socketed street lights. In every structure he entered, he found some objects trashed and some he could sell, and also some rare and better and less valuable objects, objects abandoned by accident, chances, castaways. Soon he lifted some new bauble from nearly every site, folded a broken spine paperback into his pocket, ripped a single pencil-marred Ave Maria from a hymnal, pocketed a child's toy, heavy as lead. He brought home some objects he planned to use and some he wanted to look at. And in his apartment, he chose a cupboard meant for dishes to store these more useless thefts, an exhibit of his travels in the zone, of what relics had called out in the places he'd been, the bleak houses of the blackout city. Kelly thought the world wasn't full of special objects, only plain ones. Nothing was assembled special, nothing and no one, but the plainest things could be supercharged by attention, made nuclear by suggestion. He could pick up the same object in two different houses and in one sense a completely different thrumming. What he wanted was anything loved. When he couldn't remember anymore where he had taken something from, he threw it out. Making emotion last wasn't the object's first power, but it was the power he wanted most. Anything he took from someone else's life wouldn't work forever, but if he kept acquiring more, maybe the feelings might remain, transferred across the overlap. The fall sun shining on the waving grass, the hardy scrub of trees spreading across vacancies. Everywhere, Kelly took something. He tried to leave something else behind. Metal for memories, memories for metal. There was so much he wanted gone. There was such a sprawling, untenanted city in which to dump it. 
And in the falling streets, he discovered the great perseverance of the people who remained. Their faces shined in the light wherever he saw them, on porches or in driveways, outside liquor stores and bars. He wasn't their neighbor, but he saw their beauty, the way they looked crazy with grief, the great glory of their sadness, the way it could last and last. He needed to eat, and there wasn't any work, but what was he taking from these people? Nothing, he tried to tell himself, they had not already lost. And what did this mean for him, for the good man he had tried and failed to be? In some houses, he found handwritten notes. He found one taped to the cracked plaster across from the house's front door. It read, we're leaving in the morning. And then the date the last inhabitants left not so long ago, in the back of a child's closet, he found a scrawl, a scrawl of crayon reading, I'll be back for you, written to the house, to whatever a child thought a house was. Sometimes there was an animal living there still. The animal was always a cat. What did these cats eat? Where did they sleep? Sometimes it wasn't hard to see. The skeletons of mice, the cat following Kelly from room to room, rubbing its body against his boots. Names everywhere, on the houses, in the asphalt, carved into trees, fences, doors. I love you, house, one note read. I built this house with my hands, said another. Goodbye, I'm sorry we had to leave you, but this was home. Thank you very much.